to episode 12 of the Detours in Music podcast. Today we have a great interview with James Madison University Assistant Professor of Bass, Sam Suggs. I'm Sam Suggs, and I teach double bass at James Madison. Okay. Um, can you tell us about your start in music? I got started in music when I was about three years old. My parents said I was whistling. Okay. Uh, we had a bird growing up like a beautiful Brazilian cardinal that was a wedding gift for my parents and apparently I would imitate the bird and, okay. and start making sound and then uh, when I was five they started me on piano lessons mm -hmm. from one of the local shops in Buffalo and then as I got older I started cello in fourth grade and then switched to bass in sixth grade so I could play jazz mm -hmm. with my father who um, Play, he's an amateur jazz guitarist, okay. and um, everyone on his side of the family is plays music music in some capacity, but mm -hmm. none of them professionally. And so I got into playing bass to play with them, and then um, kind of migrated towards orchestral classical stuff. Ended up going to college for music. Um, was your interest in music or interest in cello, bass, all self kind of motivated? Mm. Uh, well, I think it started with my parents, for yeah. sure. Um, they were always of the mindset that I needed to excel at whatever I do, and because um, taking lessons was something that was offered at our elementary school, mm -hmm. then they wanted me to be good at it, and I wanted to be good at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started taking some private lessons and things. And um, So, yeah, they, they inspired me to mm -hmm. have the intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it, I okay. guess. Or I mean, I guess with like switching to a different instrument uh, than piano, Yeah. maybe. Yeah, well I kept piano going actually okay. until I graduated from high school, um, mainly studying jazz, okay. and then in college I continued piano lessons and some uh, harpsichord lessons as well and things like that. My two loves at the time were bass and chemistry. Okay. I really had great chemistry teachers in high school. And I loved the, I love stoichiometry, and the fact that you can, like, say this plus this equals that, mm -hmm. and like it's more real than math. Okay. But it's like still neat and like fairly um, uh, clean. It's just clean. Okay. You know, oxygen, you burn it with this, and you get these things. Mm -hmm. So I was really into chemistry. And so I st ended up looking at schools where I could study both, okay. uh, music and chemistry. And um, I had been taking lessons. My bass teacher told me, and my high school bass teacher, who was a public teacher, um, said you should take some lessons at Eastman, mm -hmm. which is about an hour from where I grew up. Um, he said you should take some lessons with the teacher there, and he can s help set you up with college ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went there for a few months of taking lessons and he said, I told him where I wanted to apply and he said, whatever you do, like don't go to Northwestern. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to Northwestern okay. um, because I, they had a teacher that I really liked. Um, his name was Peter Lloyd, or his name is Peter Lloyd. And um, I wanted to study with him and um, I knew there were gonna be a lot of graduate students there who mm -hmm. were pretty professional and like working um, and on the verge of getting jobs and things and uh, at the time I wanted to be I was like either going to be an orchestral musician or uh, a chemist okay. and um, but Northwestern had the chemistry program on the same campus and um, anyhow so I started my freshman year okay. there studying both and um, I remember coming home spring break and being in the back of the car and kind of overwhelmed, mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it mildly, that like, you know, my teacher wasn't taking me seriously enough because I had this backup plan. Yeah. And so I said, you know, chemistry is something that will be there in 10 years and mm -hmm. 20 years and, and music is something that I would need to invest in now. Mm -hmm. And so I switched out of the chemistry program before I got to Orgo, because mm -hmm. that's where it gets really hard. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I didn't feel like I didn't enjoy standing around in the laboratory waiting, mm-hmm. and I also didn't enjoy not having as much time to practice or as much time to study for the other classes. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to narrow in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how I, I ended up at Northwestern as a music major, mm-hmm. and then midway through, like after sophomore year, my teacher was offered the position at the Colburn School okay. in LA, and so he took the position. Um, and we had like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in the course of those four years having four different teachers. I had him for two, uh, Peter for two years, and then I had three different teachers rotating in and out Mm -hmm. over the next two years. And um, gave me a lot of perspectives. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, but because of it, I actually finished my degree as uh, doing music theory. Okay. Um, The Northwestern has, and I didn't know it at the time it had like one of the most wonderful theory programs in the country. It's unique in that it was um, a combination of music theory and music cognition. Okay. Um, and so um, I actually did like an honors project mm-hmm. while I was there on 18th century composition. And um, yeah, and so basically my experience, I, I tried to flip it. So once my teacher left, then I was like gonna double down on the academic side of music. Mm-hmm and take classes with PhD students and mm-hmm. like all the fun stuff, yeah. um, seminars and things. Yeah. And um, yeah, so when he left, I had also started working in Chicago okay. um, with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, where um, basically I, I got a two year contract to play at Symphony Center, which wow. was like a dream. Yeah, as an undergrad. Yeah, too. and I was, I was, <laughs> lucky to be principal and like have leadership responsibilities Um, and it gave me a real taste of what that kind of life would be Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I switched to the theory degree then I was actually it was a way of also not playing an orchestra in school Mm -hmm. so I could just play in the evenings and have some time to have life yeah (laughs) Um, because you know you need to have a life to be a musician If, (laughs) if everything you do is music all the time then it's hard to it's hard to love it yeah it's hard to love it yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, so my undergrad was kind of diverse, and there were definite detours in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and but I was I was so you know, happy with the way it went at the end of the yeah. end of it all that um, that kind of diversity of teachers and perspectives, yeah. and being able to dip my toes in the professional world, and you know I think it was a really nice setup. And that can also help in your studio teaching now that you had so many yeah. um, perspectives very right. back to back. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> now I have students who are studying math and music and and I can totally empathize yes. with <laughs> the pull and the fact that musical careers are, um, I like to think of it more of as like a musical lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, there's no obvious career ladder, yeah. you know, with, with music in the way that like you can be promoted. Well, at least with teaching, yes, you can mm-hmm. be promoted. Um, from one rank to the next rank, but um, in everything else, it's you know it's much more nebulous, mm-hmm. yeah. and it's very up to you. <laughs> yeah, every decision that you make, I guess. Right. Um, do you think nowadays, if you weren't a musician, you would be still really interested, drawn to chemistry, or is there something yeah, else? Yeah, I don't know. I I think I think it's quite possible. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a moment when I was uh, I was finished up. I did my graduate work at Yale okay. and uh, I did a master's there for two years and then um, they have a five-year doctoral program that I just completed yes. <laughs> and um, but the the first two years here in residence and before I got the job here I was mm-hmm. like I'd, before I got the job at JMU I was thinking like oh, what am I gonna do next year like yeah. maybe maybe I could do some like high school chemistry substitute teaching yeah you know <laughs> or something I, I was brainstorming all sorts of ideas. And mm-hmm. even, you know, when I was an undergrad and I was about to graduate, I only applied to two places. Um, I applied to Rice and, and Yale mm-hmm. and because um, I didn't want to have to pay for school mm-hmm. and I didn't want to go unless it was the right fit. Mm-hmm. And um, I had like, you know, ideas about staying in northern, in the northern suburbs of Chicago and mm-hmm. just freelancing and, yeah. and um, so, I didn't know what that was going to be at all, mm-hmm. I, you know. Um, I had ideas of like, you know, 
doing house concerts and serenading all the <laughs> wealthy yeah, families yeah. on the north side. Um, but that never, I yeah. luckily I, <laughs> I stayed in school. But even just applying to your master's degree for yeah. you was more just one of the options and not like the yeah. sole option. Yeah, and I, I made a giant tree, mm -hmm. like a, a, a tree diagram of like all of the possible paths like mm -hmm. go to grad school or don't go to grad school if you don't go to grad school you know maybe you can do another year with civic or work freelance in mm -hmm. chicago or you know there were a bunch of calculus mm -hmm. until i crossed everything off except yale yeah and um yeah which was a really good fit because the program there is only graduate students there's mm -hmm. no undergraduate performance program um so you kind of get to start at the bottom again, mm -hmm. which is always useful. <laughs> um, was getting your theory degree something <clears throat> you thought that would like pursue you to do other yeah. theory specific things? Well, so actually I, when I was, um, I was finishing up my undergraduate and my advisor and one of my favorite teachers had gone to Yale mm -hmm. um, for his PhD in theory and he was encouraging me to apply for that program. Yeah. And uh, then I went to my other mentor, who was conducting the Civic Orchestra okay. in Chicago, and he said, you know, don't apply for a mm -hmm. PhD, like, you're a performer. Mm -hmm. Like, if you do the PhD, you might lose touch with that. Mm -hmm. So instead, I applied for the Master's in Performance, mm -hmm. um, thinking that if I do have, if I do want to change over to theory uh, PhD, then I could probably apply yeah. once I get there and mm -hmm. spend a year living there anyways because it's a long commitment to do yeah. a PhD um, so I kind of I went to this the school that I wanted to go to mm -hmm. for either program yeah and it was wonderful because I actually met so many of the PhD students there mm -hmm. um, you got to hear what they're going through. yeah and, and to know what that experience is and and the types of jobs they're getting and um, and it's, it's a great program mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I don't know, I kind of knew that I wanted to head in that direction and I just went in that general direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that like the theory, the, the specialization in theory in undergrad actually has influenced my teaching and my playing more than a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, it seems kind of like for you, maybe chemistry and theory are like the same side of you, yeah. but it's like the performer is what you're at least at the time we're trying to like, right. this is the time to do this, those will be there. Right, I mean, you feel like an athlete, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you know, when you're an athlete, it feels like... Only have 10 years left. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and But yeah, with theory, there's definitely, like when I was studying 18th century gallant music, there was a light bulb that turned on when my teacher was talking about um, this kind of combinatorial art. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh my God, it's just like, stoichiometry it's just mm -hmm. putting the things together in the right order and mm -hmm. and um, so that analytical part of my life mm -hmm. um, was like manifested by music theory but then I found that performance could also be a way of manifesting theory yeah so, and you perform a lot of your own compositions and actually that was when I first started yeah I first started around my senior year I, I played um, this piece that I written Mm -hmm. That was based on Haydn's Lost Bass Concerto, and um, it was basically using 18th century techniques to okay. rewrite this piece. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it wasn't until I got to grad school that I committed to always performing something of my own composition on a program, mm -hmm. even if it's like not a great composition, yeah. even if it's just a little thing. Um, but making, it's a bar to set yourself. Yeah, to just prepare. something that's like well. You know, if anyone knows how to write for this instrument, it's going to be bass players. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, most of our standard repertoire is written by bass players. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of, if you have an, I would say, if you have an instinct to compose and you play the bass, you need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, because the native repertoire is what we're lacking. Yeah. Well, we have plenty of it, but stuff that you enjoy playing and mm -hmm. that it's connects well. with you. <laughs> yeah, because there was a burst of, new music in the 70s and for bass and there's some good stuff but mm -hmm. not not all of it has entered the canon yet mm -hmm. um was your big struggle you think in undergraduate degree um making the choice to commit to either performance theory mm. or um 
something else on the cross of your three yeah. degrees? Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things was, you know, having a very strict teacher mm -hmm. um, who I was trying to win the respect of. And, um, and then in the absence of that, having to challenge myself to basically, you know, I mean, the, the second teacher I had would say to do things this way. Mm -hmm. And then the third teacher would say, no, no, mm -hmm. that's like impractical. Mm -hmm. You'll never get a job doing that. And then the fourth teacher was like, everything you learn from the thir second teacher yeah. is backwards. Yeah. And so, you know, having to develop a sense of self mm -hmm. throughout like your that. own ideas of right. what you think is right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, just to synthesize and take away the, the parts that you think are useful. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that ended up being really good because in grad school I had the same teacher for four years. Mm -hmm. And he was able to, as best as he could, focus me. Mm -hmm. And um, at least provide some stability as I wrapped all those ideas around a more focused um, approach mm -hmm. and um, yeah and, and it's t it's taken until well I'm still not there yet but being out of school mm -hmm. you know has helped so much for me to settle mm -hmm. those ideas and apply them to my own students yeah. and um, so um, I think overall it's like the biggest challenge was kind of you know all the pieces that are moving around you mm -hmm. like help y you identify you where you're standing mm -hmm. like I feel like I was spinning around but like <laughs> what I need to be looking at is right under my feet mm -hmm. where am I um, so um, one thing I've noticed in giving constructive criticism mm -hmm. is sometimes I think the things that I'm telling them are like the thing I hate hearing from my teacher yeah. or something it's like why is that the thing that like sticks right. out in my head and so you don't even realize sometimes what sticks with you until you're teaching someone right else, maybe. it's true there are definitely like um, styles of teaching that like okay you it's almost like parenting mm -hmm. you know it's like well my parents treated me this way and so I know how to treat people uh, I don't not to get too yeah. psychological <laughs> but there there are definite moments where I, I'll say something in a lesson and I'll be like wow that's what uh, so-and-so told me mm -hmm. you know and and in a, in a way if it's healthy then it feels like you're passing the yeah. baton saying like this was good advice yeah have some good advice yeah you know pass it on but you know we kind of as teachers also have to filter mm -hmm. you know you get to choose which ideas live and die exactly and in that baton chain mm -hmm. um so yeah but i know i know exactly what you mean yeah. it's like you're the things that are hard for you to hear but i've digested them mm -hmm. you know and like well you know, I realized I was having a hard time making a just a very simple core sound mm -hmm. with the bass. Um, and part of it was string choice. Part of it was understanding what th the word core meant mm -hmm. and never actually having the, the confidence um, to confront my teacher about what does that mean? Yeah. And um, can we talk about, like, I'm an analytical learner. Like, mm -hmm. can we talk about how we like define that word mm -hmm. so that um, I can understand how to achieve it yes and now that I'm teaching it I'm like okay then I gotta <laughs> figure it out yeah but maybe not your students aren't analytical learners so it's yeah, the way you would describe right, it needs to right. be different and it's tough because as a teacher it's like okay you have to adapt to their learning styles but also know that like you know I have my kind of home yeah. default style that I myself use mm -hmm. and so it's interesting because in order to teach in that way, you kind of have to learn to the other styles, mm -hmm. like to learn for yourself. Yes, definitely. So, yeah. Um, what are a couple examples of advice you hear yourself giving all the time, mm -hmm. um, either to students or other young musicians? Yeah, I have like a very simple, um, a simple pyramid. I don't know if it's a pyramid. Maybe it's a, tri it's a triangle. Okay. <laughs> of um, musical experiences that I think keep people rounded okay and that's that you want to work with an amateur an expert and a novice every month mm -hmm. you know if you're working with people who do music because they love it mm -hmm. and not because they're trying to stake their career mm -hmm. or their ambitions on it the amateur will keep you refreshed mm -hmm. the novice will keep you working because mm -hmm. you see people around you that are working very hard 
and inspired by youth, inspired by the desire to learn, mm -hmm. and keeping them close is going to keep you moving. Yeah. And then obviously having an expert, someone who's experienced and perhaps a little cynical, but um, that you can negotiate that cynicism mm -hmm. with the amateur. It's, it's like three branches of government or yeah, something. Yeah. And so for me, uh, I often give the advice that like, if you can hit all three of those every month or so, mm -hmm. then you'll have a healthy music life. Mm -hmm. um, and I also talk to my students a lot about the fact that our goal as performers is mostly to realize the idea of the composer. Mm, and okay. so therefore, you know, all of the theory stuff that I get into is like ways of trying to think like a composer. Um, and so, you know, it, I used to think if you wanted to understand Bach, you probably should learn German okay. because <laughs> like he thought in German. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, if we're not thinking in German, we're not thinking like Bach. Yeah. And that's like a, a long extension. but. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to try to get into the language of the mm -hmm. composition yeah. and think like a composer, think like a conductor. Mm -hmm. um, when students are preparing auditions and things, I say that um, you know, the, if you're, say, auditioning for an orchestra, you have to convince a jury mm -hmm. of like other musicians, not just bass players. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think like other musicians. What do flute players think about the bass? Yeah. Um, but the final boss, the final round is the conductor. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't have uh, an engaging dialogue with the conductor through your instrument, mm -hmm. then you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and so to have that engaging conversation through your instrument, you should want to be able to have that, you know, just yeah. human to human Yes. Uh, without the instrument. But that is definitely a very lofty goal <laughs> oh yeah to be able to communicate all of that yeah well I mean I, I think actually because most of my undergraduate I, I, I was I'm very idealistic mm -hmm. and um, you know I was at the library all the time I I checked out every single book on technique mm -hmm. that a string technique that the school had mm -hmm. you know, the violins and the cellos and the bass and and, and, then, and then some and I would just read them before bed mm -hmm. you know like we didn't have smartphones yeah. <laughs> at the time, and so I was just like every night just reading yeah. technique books, and um, which was really at the end of the day like formative. Mm -hmm. It was technique books or theory books or something, um, and you know re reading like I remember reading Bernstein's um, the transcript of the unanswered question, okay. and that was like unbelievable mm -hmm. you know I, I had no idea that people were thinking about music in this way and um, yeah there's still a handful of books like that out there that I recommend to my students mm -hmm. and um, that I think are extremely transformative mm -hmm. when like because the other thing I realized in undergrad and this is something I try to pass to the students as well is like when you hit that wall with a piece mm -hmm. where you can't just like you hit a plateau and it's like this piece is only getting a little bit better every week mm -hmm. then it's time to do a new piece mm -hmm. um, like if you know nothing about like I don't know Indonesian cooking mm -hmm. like you could learn a lot mm -hmm. in a very short span of time but if you wanted to be a master chef yeah like it's gonna take a very long growth um, so if you could start a new piece and mm -hmm. have a very sharp learning curve um, it's a better use of your time mm -hmm. and then you can come back to the piece and see that you've you've improved and buffed mm -hmm. in different places yeah um, so as far as like yeah advice I, it's like you want to attack the things where you have the most potential for growth mm -hmm. um, and not get when you feel like you're stuck pivot mm -hmm. and then come back yeah have you been persuaded to change your career focus maybe? Mm. yeah persuaded I, I would say like might imply that there was like some hand that mm -hmm. was like you should do this yeah. you should do that um, I would say in that way you know I was finishing up graduate school and um, a job had opened up for a teaching position near my hometown mm -hmm. and um, I was talking to my career advisor um, and she basically was writing me a letter of recommendation mm -hmm. and she's like also you know there's this job at James Madison mm -hmm. and um, 
So that's it. I mean, I found out about the position here through her mm -hmm. um, and persuaded. I don't know if it's a persuasion thing, but yeah. it's kind of like an opportunity was was like shown to me at yeah. the right time. Uh -huh. And um, otherwise, like I, I might still be freelancing in yeah. in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very fortunate in a lot of ways because these types of positions are rare. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky to be given a chance. I was like 25 when I started here. Yeah. And so um, I was lucky that they trusted me to, to do this job. Yeah. Um, and even coming to Virginia was probably not something you ever expected. Yeah, I, I had no idea I'd live in Virginia. Yeah. I, I had no idea that I'd really, like, I, I don't know, Virginia is such, like, a massive state. Mm -hmm. There's so much here, and and I feel like I still haven't explored it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, anyhow, it's, it's good Came to be Came at the here. right time. Yeah, <laughs> the right time. Um, you might not have experienced a detour in music necessarily yet in life, but do you think that... Um, there's a way that you define that or mm. what you have noticed with your career thus far. Yeah. Well, I think the, the detour that I found is like the biggest thing was when I was in school, mm -hmm. um, it felt like there was a very clear objective. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I was like, I want to be principal bass of this orchestra, blah, blah, blah. And like that seemed like um, the best thing you could do. Yeah. And... Um, what I realized, you know, as I came out of school and I started doing more of my own stuff and, mm -hmm. and writing more music and engaging with a more variety of communities with new music and early music and chamber music and mm -hmm. um, recognizing that, like, that doesn't have to be the goal. Mm -hmm. You know, to have that musical lifestyle doesn't mean playing in the orchestra. Yeah. And even like my teaching job, sometimes it feels like a day job mm -hmm. uh, that compensates for my performing life. Mm -hmm. And um, so in, in a sense, it, for me, the detour is like realizing that um, goals aren't always as clear mm -hmm. as they need to be. And some of my friends who do win big jobs and things like that, they're still not necessarily yeah. happy. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know... Um, Figuring out a healthy balance is much mm -hmm. more important, and um, it's weird because the conser sometimes the conservatory mindset is like you have to win competitions, you have mm -hmm. to win this. And for for what I've discovered is like okay, there's a community. Mm -hmm. The bass community is very um, strong. We have mm -hmm. a very strong community, and um, what I found is like the detour has been from like wanting to fill the role that everyone else wants to fill mm -hmm. to finding my own Making your voice own, yeah. and my own niche within that community, mm -hmm. um, which feels much better mm -hmm. in a lot of ways than like throwing myself at auditions. Mm -hmm. um, because there are people who want to do that more than I do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's some people, like, I always think too that like I came to this instrument through the piano. Mm -hmm. um, I came to this instrument by choice between like being an engineer in a stable job and, mm -hmm. and being an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people don't have that option. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're good at music and that's what, that's all they can do. Yeah. And um, so they choose music because there's like no other option. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's something to be like said for that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also something to be said that, like, this was a intentional choice mm -hmm. um, amongst an array of possibilities. Yeah. And um, in that way, I feel, like, a little bit less anxious to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. but to, like, if my career wasn't perfect, I'd figure something else out. Mm -hmm. um, and because I don't have that anxiety on me, I think it frees me up to mm -hmm. do things that um, maybe others wouldn't pursue. Yeah. When you were talking about sort of feeling like you had to earn the respect mm -hmm. of your first teacher because yeah. you had an outside interest, yeah. I think that's kind of a very polarizing topic in music is if you're even like allowed to do more than one thing even in yeah. music. Right. Yeah, I mean, my teacher didn't know that I played piano at mm -hmm. all until I accompanied someone's jury. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, you know, there were times where... Um, 
there's a different. Actually, I will say that like when I interviewed for the position at JMU, mm-hmm. it involved um, a, a, like a performance, a recital. It involved interviews. It involved mm-hmm. teaching a class. It involved um, like doing a presentation, like a scholarly presentation. And it was one of the few times where I felt like someone was asking for what is everything that you can do yeah. and offer rather than what is the one specific thing mm-hmm. that you can do that's slightly better than the next person. Yeah. Um, and so in that way, it felt like it felt right. Mm-hmm. You know, it felt like I was being respected as a whole person yeah. um, instead of for a very niche thing. Yes. Um, a lot of faculty in their interviews so far have mentioned that they feel like at JMU they have like full respect and opportunity to continue to grow and not yeah. to stay the person they were when they were hired. It's true. It's true. And I've changed a lot since then. That's something that I try to focus on with the podcast is that you don't just have to practice, just have to get like that one job right. in order to feel successful yeah. or to be respected. Right. And uh, you know the the last advice thing I talk to my students about is um, I use like a I love metaphors. Mm-hmm. And I, I talk about the beach. Okay. And as a kid, I loved digging holes at the beach. There was no real point to it. <laughs> I wasn't trying to get to the center of the earth or mm-hmm. anything. Just digging. Yeah. Um, and when you're digging straight down, there's a, there's a particular angle at which the walls start crumbling in. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you have to make the hole wider. Mm-hmm. And so what I try to convince my students is you want to go as deep as you can. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that means going wider. Yeah. yeah. But you need to have at least one thing that will take you as far down as you can go. Mm-hmm. The, the ability to go far down and deep um, is going to get you like your foot in the door. Yeah. Like, you know, practicing for me was a means to getting good enough that I could then be asked to do things. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, if I didn't have um, skills to back up yeah. what I'm doing then I, I wouldn't be deep enough to be hanging out with the people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the mole people. That will get you more, right. yeah. Right. And so, you know, you want to try to figure out, like, I mean, I have a good friend who, he's a bass player, and he does old-time music. Okay. And, um, but he's also a fiddler. Uh, he's, and he was, like, a really great bass player, which opened the door for him to play with really great fiddlers. Mm-hmm. And once he had that door open, then he... It's basically switched to playing fiddle mm-hmm. um, because he was able to hang with them and learn from them and be part of that community. Mm-hmm. But he may not have gotten to that community through fiddling, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So sometimes it's like a means to get into the crowd mm-hmm. that will um, help you grow even more. Yeah. Maybe the Brahms. Okay. Just like the study Bach. There, there you will find everything. That was kind of my philosophy in undergrad, because mm-hmm. I remember going to um, hear some Mahler mm-hmm. and not understanding, like, I couldn't quite comprehend, and, uh, like, the analytical part of my brain was like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't quite swallow it yes. all. And so I thought, well, if I can't, like, maybe if I understand Brahms, then I'll understand Mahler. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you listen to Brahms, like, wow. Maybe I if think, I understand. I think if I understand Beethoven, then yeah. I'll understand Brahms. Mm-hmm. And then if I understand Haydn and Mozart, like, mm-hmm. the, you know, and I kept moving backwards, uh, which took me to that kind of, to Bach and like 18th century music, mm-hmm. that, you know, there is a foundation for music history being a series of reactions mm-hmm. to the past. Yeah. Um, and without that, then I, I don't feel connected like I need to feel that connection, um, or else, you know, choices. Like it, seeing music as a series of choices um, seems meaningless unless those choices are informed. Are, yeah, yeah, are somehow in a dialogue with everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you think that that impacts your composition? Uh, yeah, I think in a way, you know, I'm, I'm trying to. Personally, I've written a lot of music in older styles, mm-hmm. which is a way of. Um, I highly recommend it because once you've written a piece like in the style of Haydn Mm -hmm. and then you attack another Haydn piece, Mm -hmm. you see it not as like beautiful music but as a series of choices. Mm -hmm. And that 
and those choices are beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, like with my, as I get older and I start writing music in what I'm developing as my own voice, mm -hmm. um, it's hard. But I, I do think that like you need to stay connected to those things. Mm -hmm. And even as like a new music person who, who plays a lot of new music, um, I have friends that go purely in that direction of contemporary mm -hmm. music. Um, but then sometimes they lose touch with like harmony mm -hmm. and the kind of expectations and functions of like playing Bach and Mozart and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I mean m my favorite cellist is this guy Jay Campbell okay. who plays with the Jack Quartet and they do the most amazing contemporary music but his Bach is like mm -hmm. unbelievably beautiful and mm -hmm. like ah, it's just yeah. really wonderful. <laughs> And so to hear musicians that can really um, balance both, yeah. to me, it makes it the contemporary music more meaningful, mm -hmm. um, so that it's it's uh, grounded. Well, I think as someone who's always been in school, mm -hmm. you know, going from being a student and then immediately becoming a teacher, mm -hmm. um, it's taken some time. I mean, it's very it's a very um, aggressive flip mm -hmm. at first because you suddenly see the strings mm -hmm. behind the puppet. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, um, it takes some time to adjust, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, to feel like uh, you're not an imposter. Yeah. You know, that, that imposter syndrome is, is real, even mm -hmm. like on the level of like being hired mm -hmm. as a total person, like they, they got to see everything I do mm -hmm. and everything I've done. Now you have and to keep it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and so I feel that pressure, but also um, it's funny that, you know, this is my fourth year now, and when you first start a new job, like mm -hmm. they have all these resources that are like, um, you know, first year evaluations, they have new faculty orientation and all this mm -hmm. stuff, but you're just trying to figure out how to do your job. Mm -hmm. and. You know, just maybe to say that my experience has been like it's taken me three years um, to figure out how to do my job, mm -hmm. and um, now I'm ready for all the orientation stuff yeah. <laughs> and how to figure out the balance. But yeah. it doesn't all happen at once. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. You don't like know how to do the job and how to have a healthy balance mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I guess um, that's one of the big things I've learned since moving here mm -hmm. and there's like so many adjustments that you make when you move for a new job mm -hmm. um, and yeah and keeping up your relationships like with the past is so helpful yeah to help ground you through that process as always you can keep up with the podcast on instagram at detours and music podcast on youtube at detours and music podcast and on spotify and apple music podcast apps um, make sure to subscribe, rate, and give all the love you can to the podcast. Next time, we're going to have an interview with Professor of Horn at James Madison University, Ian Zook. Mm -hmm.